was at 1.30 p.m. on Friday the 18th of October 2024. What then did the Honorable Judges of the High Court of Kenya conserve? What were they conserving? There was nothing to conserve. In the logic of the law, we've been told that to, uh, a lot about why the Constitution is very important, why it's very special, why it's very transformative, why it's not like the Constitution of other kind. It may very well be all that. But the Constitution is a law to interpret, to be interpreted the way we interpret all laws. When we read a will, we don't start searching for the spirit of the will. Because the will is speaking. It is saying, I leave my assets to my son, to my daughter, to my uncle. So a person reading a will doesn't tell the family, before we read the will, let us capture the spirit of the will. If we read a tenancy agreement, we do not say, let us capture the spirit of the tenancy. The tenancy agreement is speaking on its face until there is an ambiguity, which is the same thing with the Constitution. It says what it says until there is an ambiguity. Where is the ambiguity when the Constitution has said, shall, shall cease to hold office? It is our first submission. There is no ambiguity. There is no reason to search for any other meaning, any other spirit, any other constructiveness. The honorable, the honorable, the petitioner is aware of that. There is an affidavit here called supplementary affidavit in support of the petition. What does it say in paragraph 22? In this case, however, Kithura Kindiki was unqualified because he had not been a member of UDA political party for three months preceding the nomination. He was ineligible for nomination to the elective position of deputy president under Article 37 on the 18th of October 20, when the vacancy arose. This is not the Attorney General's affidavit. It is the petitioner's affidavit. So that his lawyers may be acting contrary to his express instructions. Because he has sworn an affidavit in which he acknowledges that that office became vacant. It is our second submission that when the so-called conservatory orders, and my colleagues will demonstrate that these are not conservatory orders, these were mandatory injunctive orders of a nature not contemplated by the Constitution in this circumstance. At 1.31 p.m., when the conservatory orders both were issued both in uh, Kerogoya and in Nairobi, there was nothing available to conserve. The substratum of their complaint had been overtaken by events. And so much so, my lords, that, uh, and my landed friends will take you through this, there are several judges who were approached to give conservatory orders, including this bench, and you said there are matters here already overtaken by events. That news may not have reached other parts of the country. Very briefly, I will argue the public interest. My lords, this constitution is a constitution to protect everybody. Sometimes it is cited as if it was tailored only to protect a section of, of, of the society in Kenya. It is for everybody, including the institutions that it, it, it establishes. It is to protect the judiciary. 
It is to protect the legislature. It is to protect the executive. We are told continuously that the, the executive is a problem. The executive is a problem. The executive is also protected by law. The president has a power donated by this constitution to nominate a deputy president. He did that. He has a power to send that name to court, uh, to parliament. He did that. Parliament has a power to vote on that vote. It did that. But it is being suggested that that in itself finds no protection under the constitution. <coughs> what finds protection in the constitution is the conservatory order that came from uh, uh, that came from Kirogoya. Kirogoya, yeah, yeah. Some a place called Kirogoya. <laughs> we were told, my lord, and this is true, that the impeachment process is a special process. It's sui generis. It is neither civil nor criminal. It, uh, it's a process sui generis. And that is why, and this cannot be said many times, enough times, that is why the framers of the Constitution do not say that a vice president will be brought to the Supreme Court of Kenya and tried for violations of the Constitution. It is a political process. It goes to a political chamber. Senate seats as a political body. That's what happens in there. When Dr. Kaminwa says impeachments are never successful in the United States, it is because of the peculiar politics of the United States. Because the impeachment process, even there, is more political than it is here. So we have we must have fidelity to law, my lords. It is our submission. <coughs> if you read through the case of Kirero Nguge, it is in our bundle, and I will not. And if you read the case of uh, Martin Wambora, uh, the, uh, Kirero Nguge is instructive. This is what the court said, and I'll be very brief. A court must satisfy itself that the case before it is not caught up by the bar of non-justiciability. The concept of non-justiciability is comprised of three doctrines. Firstly, the political question doctrine. Secondly, the constitutional avoidance doctrine. Thirdly, the ripeness doctrine. Actually, much was said about justiciability. This is not new law. This is old law. It is thousands of years law, thousands of years of English law. The first thing the judge would ask is, what is your course of action? You must have a course of action. The court is not a forum where litigants can hold an academic debate. The judge will always ask, what is your course of action? Okay? Now, so the doctrine of justiciability may sound new, but it is as old as the common law. What is the political question doctrine? We are not going to argue it. But it is actually straightforward that the Constitution recognizes that it has donated power and authority to several institutions. And each institution should keep to its lane. We have developed a constitutional law, or we are developing a constitutional law here, that that actually is in con that actually invites contravention of the constitution, and it is this: that every conceivable social, political, cultural, economic grievance grievance is capable of a constitutional resolution. How is that? How is that? It is not possible. And that is why in, in our political social system, we have a million other ways of resolving conflict. Not all conflict is justiciable. Not all grievances 
are amenable to a constitutional solution. Now, let me go to my second last point about um, I want to take you to the case of county government of Kisi and two others versus the Independent Electoral Commission. It is a 2024 decision, and this is the last thing I'll say before I invite my colleagues to come in. The gracious lady will not have to bang her gong. This is what the court said in that matter. While guided and applying the foregoing, in this case, the law does not anticipate that the office of the deputy governor shall remain vacant indefinitely for whatever reason. Having so held that gazettement is a mere administrative formality and taking into consideration the circumstances of the instant case, whereby nomination and approval by the county assembly of Kisi was undertaken way back in April 2024, it would be unconstitutional to further delay and postpone indefinitely the filing, the filling of the vacancy of the office of the deputy governor of Kisi. That's what that court said. Finally, 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 because I'm still within time, the Wajia case shows that our constitution has self-correcting provisions. What happened there, my lords, will remember? Yes is that uh, the governor had been impeached. During his impeachment, another, the, the, the deputy governor assumed the high office of governor. He went to court. After a long litigation, the court found his impeachment was wrong. And then the court said, reverse the order. Uh, just to use an expression by my learned friend, I think it was Mr. Kibbe Mongai. The law, the law is organized. The, the heavens didn't come down in Wajia. The law said, go back to your office, go back to your office, and the rest of you go home and do something else. That's, that is how to ensure certainty, predictability, stability. That is what we should have here. We are here. We. I am told on behalf of the Attorney General to assure you that for as long as this matter is litigated, uh, the, 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 the law will be observed. If a day comes when anything needs to be reversed, that will be reversed. But for now, the public interest is in continuity. Thank you. Yes, my Lord. Uh, your Ladyship and my Lords, let me dive right into my submissions and I will demonstrate my Lord that contrary to the submissions made by my landed friends articles 47 right together with articles 50 and article 25 1c on the right to a fair hearing were complied with. And I will show, my Lord, that as of the time that notice was received in Senate by the Speaker on the 9th of October 2024, notices were issued to the petitioner to file all the documents as prescribed and to defend himself to every question that was raised in the National Assembly, which, my Lord, you recall, had voted by 282 members to impeach the Deputy President. The right of fair trial, fair administrative action under Article 47, and the right to a fair hearing were therefore preserved. And I will just demonstrate as I move on to show that once the 16th and the 17th were gazetted as the dates when the deputy president would be heard, and that would be the Wednesday and Thursday of October 2024, the motion, the seven-day period when 
motions and pleadings were exchanged then commenced. And all parties were aware that the Senate investigations would take two days. Your Ladyship and my Lords, parties were then invited to respond to every allegation. This was a two-tire trial, my Lords. <clears throat> the National Assembly, sitting as the initial uh, chamber that received the impeachment motion, voting in the affirmative for the impeachment motion, no brainer. The Senate, as a trial chamber, my Lord, Articles 94 and 95, uh, donating powers to Senate and to the National Assembly, respectively. The Senate then proceeded to afford an opportunity. And I want to just demonstrate, my Lord, that Article 1, 2 of the Constitution designates Senate as the National Assembly as speaking for the people under Article 1. Because the people may either access their powers directly or through their elected representatives. So my Lord must read the Constitution in the sense that the Constitution then, speaking through the people, Senate was the trial chamber that undertook the trial as by the Constitution contemplated. My Lord, what happened on the 16th was the commencement of the trial. And it's important to respond to this factual question. That the petitioner participated in the entire trial. Only the petitioner, my Lord, had the opportunity to cross-examine all the witnesses presented by the National Assembly that presented this case before the Senate. Senate sitting as a trial chamber as a whole and therefore as a quasi-judicial body. Each senator, considering the allegations and bundles, served to every senator uh, prior to the trial. My lords, it was on the 17th, and this is an, an important distinction, at 2.30, p.m. after Senate had adjourned at 1.15 p.m. that Senior Counsel Paul Mutten presented to Senate an adjournment on the basis that he could not trace the petition of the Deputy President at the time. He informed the Senate that he, were, he had learned of his client's illness but did not reach him. He then sought an adjournment to 5 p.m. He had two and a half hours to trace his client. My lords, there's a curious point here, and this is important, my lords. The provisions of Article 145, 5, and 6, and I want to refer to those articles, provide, my lord, that at an impeachment hearing before Senate, a party may be represented, 145.5, the president or deputy president shall have the right to appear and be represented before the special committee during investigations. This article was wholly satisfied because the deputy president was present throughout the trial. My Lord, then Article 145.6a and b then step in. If the claims have been substantiated, the Senate shall after according the president an opportunity to be heard, vote on the impeachment charges. My Lord, Senate accorded the deputy president an opportunity to be heard. How was that accorded, my Lord? That was accorded, my Lord, first to be heard through the pleadings filed in Senate. That is one. But number two, my Lord, he was present during the entire presentation of the case by the National Assembly. But third, my Lord, he was given and afforded an adjournment at 2.30, from 1 p.m. to 2.30. At 2.30, he was accorded an adjournment to come back at 5 p.m. My Lord, what happened at 5 p.m. is summarized at paragraphs 25 to 28 of our submissions. And it goes like this, my Lord. At 5 p.m., my Lords, the Deputy President, the Council for the Deputy President, Senior Council Paul Mwite, 
submitted or told Senate that he could not trace his client, but that he had been admitted at Karen Nostra. He neither presented a medical report nor a report from any doctor. And that is an important observation. But beyond failing to present any document to demonstrate the truthfulness of the health status of the Deputy President, my Lord, counsel and his team, Senior Counsel Paul Mwite, Eminent Counsel Elisha Ngoya, and the entire team proceeded to walk out. And why did they proceed to walk out, my Lord? Perhaps they did not read the wording of the Constitution and or the standing orders. Because our party, my lords, may be presented or may be present at trial by himself or through an advocate or representative. In this case, my lord, every opportunity was presented to the respondents to present, but they opted, my lord, not to proceed and not to provide any document to Senate at that point to, my lord, uh, uh, confirm, my lord, at the point that their client or the deputy president, that matter, was unwell and admitted. Senate then proceeded, my lords, to vote on that question. My lord, this is where standing order 85 comes in and rule 6 and 7. I will, I will elaborate. Number one, my lord, understanding order 85, senators on a procedural motion may vote by acclamation. That vote was carried and Senate then voted to proceed. My lord, the catch here is rule 12 of the rules that govern the proceedings. Once the 16th and the 17th of October 2024 were gazetted as the days that we had to proceed, that Senate proceeded, my lord, the proceedings had to be sequential and could not be stopped because of the requirement that the proceedings were time bound and were to conclude in 10 days. The last day, my lord, that the proceedings were to conclude was the Saturday the next day. My lord, unfortunately, counsel, senior counsel Mwite, and the, the Hansard will demonstrate this, my lord, had applied for an adjournment to the following Tuesday. My lord, we, we have demonstrated that the petitioner dragged the carpet from his own feet deliberately decided to sabotage his own appearance when he had been in court for the in 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 senate for the last two days up to 1 15 pm before deciding not to be reachable by his entire team and the team making it worse by disaster my lord my lords and relationships the petitioner had taken part in the cross-examination of all the parties no case, my lord, has been presented before you that one, there was a violation of the standing orders of Senate. That's number one. Number two, that Senate did not consider some material defense to any of the charges that were proffered against the Deputy President. My lord, I just want to, uh, for clarity of thought, submit that even on the submission that my learned friend Mr. Masharia made before this court, this court, that there was additional evidence that was entertained by the speaker under Rule 6 and 7 by hearing a witness called Mr. Njomo. I remember that submission a lot. My Lord, that was a substantiation of a charge on economic crimes that failed. Only, my Lord, Five out of the 11 charges proffered against the Deputy President petitioner hearing succeeded. Only five out of the 11 charges. How else can Senate have been judicious? It threw out six charges. None of the petitions brought before you seems to commend Senate for standing its high ground and throwing out six of the charges. And that is what good faith uh, uh, would mean, my lord. That out of the six charges, my lord, my lord, the deputy president was convicted 
on the gross violation of articles 10 to a b 27 and 129 on the shareholding remark he was also convicted on the other grounds on national cohesion and on the question that is live before this court my lord that is on violating his code that requires him to undertake certain function and undermining the function of the national security intelligence service miss kimodo of kimodo and company advocates would want the deputy president to apologize on that count that's a live matter but my lord in the grant of conservatory orders i submit and this is because i argued munya i argued wajir i argued munya i argued mate so i'm, I'm an authority in this area <laughs> clearly in your lord in the, on the, the principles that the court considered, the Supreme Court considered in the Munya case, but public interest, I think on the scales, weighed highest that this court must take into account the import of a conservatory order issued ex parte against public interest. My Lord, this is a country that is built on the constitution of Kenya 2010 with a president whose powers are defined under article 131 of the constitution and article 131 as a writer that the president's role as the chief executive of the country shall be performed by himself directly and through delegation by the deputy president this country therefore cannot contemplate an interregnum. That means space of power. Yeah. 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 An interregnum is not contemplated by the Constitution. The position of the Deputy President, my Lord and my Lady, must therefore be filled at all times. And that is why the applicants know well that this country must move on and have a Deputy President sworn in because of the dictates of Article 131 of the Constitution. My lady and my lords, a conservatory order is therefore inconceivable in the terms defined in the Munya case. A conservatory order of the nature issued by Justice Mwongo is not only, is not only unfeasible, but flies in the face of principles of public interest. <coughs> the interest in Meru County then was to avoid an interregnum in the governance structure so that Meru County could not collapse. And we took the bold measure to go to court at that time to protect Munya. This court would only use that authority to support the appointment of His Excellency Honorable Professor so that this country moves to the second level. I would urge you to discharge the conservatory order on that principle alone that the wider public interest is greater than the interest of the former deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. But Lord, wherein would his remedies lie, well, I friend your body will submit. If it is a salary of one month, that would be compensable by damages. If it is a weak salary that is six that I should have been or to have been deputy president, that would be compensated in my term. But this country, my lord, cannot be at a standstill and be held through litigation because we need to have that position filled. My lord, if I move to the other point, my lord, we have submitted that since every opportunity was accorded to the deputy president to present his case and that he failed to present his case my lord every argument before this court every argument before this court by malani friends on the import of the processes of an impeachment fall on their back they fall on their back my lord because the authority in my movie Sonko and Nairobi City County Assembly, and I'm, again I argued this one, my lord. 
in fact, I was in this matter. In this case, my lord, the impeachment was upheld. In this case, Michael Mbufi Sonko had sought to fold the process leading to the impeachment because there were no reasons given for the impeachment. The Court of Appeal rightly stating that one, there was the Hansard that contained reasons. Two, my lord, in terms of an impeachment, my lord, Mike Movie Song was challenging the approach where the Senate sat as a whole, as a committee of the whole. The court finding, my lord, that that is an option that is open to Senate and cannot speak to the lawfulness or otherwise. Council on the other side submitted that there was need for a committee. Senate, in its proceedings, my lord, in its wisdom, had voted to proceed through the whole house and accorded the petitioner all his rights that were due to him at the initial stage only for the petition to petitioner not to avail himself to take advantage of the second opportunity to be had. My Lord, we submit, my Lord, that unless the processes of Senate are faulted by my landed friends, the impeachment became final when the vote was taken before midnight on the 17th. And His Excellency, the Deputy President, Rigathi Gashagwa, stood impeached henceforth. Unfortunately, my lords, this is an impeachment which has no comeback. It is like a death. You have died. You can't come back to life. But you can have certain claims in succession. <laughs> and that is why we have the law of succession. Rights and remedies then come into question. My <coughs> Lord, set aside the conservatory orders. Let us move on, my lords. The bigger public interest tilts in favor of the appointment of His Excellency Professor Kidure Kindiki, a very good man. Thank you. Thank you. My Lord and my lady, my name is Mudomi Dionkolu for the Secured Interested Party. <laughs> And to that end, we have filed a notice of preliminary objection dated the 24th of October, the year 2024. We have, in addition to that, filed a list and battle of authorities on that preliminary objection. And that list and battle is dated the 25th day of October, 2024. And pursuant to your directions, those are the battles, my Lord, I would suggest you hold them close to you because I'll be referring to them shortly. <coughs> we have in addition filed written submissions, skeleton submissions dated the 27th day of October 2024. Before I delve into the PO, my lord, a suggestion was made to you. I had forgotten to tell you, my lord, that I appear for the second interest in party together with my learning friend, Mr. Stephen Ogola. Before I go to the PO, my lord, a number of things were said by my friends and learned friends. I mean it because we are both friends in addition to being learned. One of the things you are told is to laugh at me for raising this PO. The other thing you are told is that uh, the PO was determined in some rulings and directions you issued. And our simple answer, my lord, is that unless I am mistaken, 
observations made by the court at the expert stage before full benefit of argument from all sides cannot be the subject of a submission that the issue is settled. But if you listen to me why we have raised this PO and you find that I deserve to be laughed at, it's okay. My Lord, we, our PO makes only three interrelated points. The point number one, which you will find in paragraph one of our written submission, is that the High Court's jurisdiction under Article 23, which governs human rights litigation, and Article 165, which is about enforcement of the Constitution, to confirm whether anything. I'm here to tell you very shortly, my lords, the word anything does not actually mean anything in the literal sense, and specifically to tell you that your jurisdiction under that Article 165 does not extend to disputes as to the impeachment of the president and the deputy president. Yes, the court has jurisdiction to enforce human rights. The court has jurisdiction to confirm whether anything allegedly done in the name of the constitution is constitutional, but our submission is that that apparently very broad jurisdiction does not extend to a dispute as to the impeachment of the president or the deputy president of the republic. And that is the point made in paragraphs one all the way to seven of our preliminary objection. Number two, point number two, this court and indeed all other courts of the Republic of Kenya have no jurisdiction to entertain a dispute as to the impeachment of the president and the deputy president. But if we are wrong in that submission, my lord, because I have been wrong many times, we make the submission that the only court that would conceivably, arguably, mark my words, conceivably and arguably have jurisdiction on this dispute is the Supreme Court. And that is the subject of paragraph 8 of our preliminary objection. My Lord, why do we say that this court, though we acknowledge its broad jurisdiction under Article 23 and 165 does not extend to presidential impeachment disputes. The reasons, my Lord, are set in paragraph 6 of our submissions. And the simple point is this, that our Constitution denies this court, the High Court jurisdiction, on countless matters that would fall under chapter 4 on the Bill of Rights. Case in point, presidential elections involve human rights under Article 38. It is clear in the Constitution that this court has no jurisdiction of a dispute relating to a presidential election. Even if someone were to come here and say that he was denied his Article 38, which is a human right under that election. My Lord, it is clear by dint of Article 58, sub Article 5, that this court has no jurisdiction to hear a dispute as to a declaration of a state of emergency. My Lord and friend, Mr. Ngoya, talks of the word decency. I hope we are all sufficiently decent to acknowledge that nothing invades the entire regime of human rights than a declaration of emergency. That declaration can affect the right to assembly, to expression, to basically everything. And yet the Constitution is clear if you have a dispute as to that matter. Never mind it, it has abrogated the entire Bill of Rights. The court you go to is not the High Court. It is the Supreme Court. My Lord, property 
is a matter of the Bill of Rights, Article 40. It is clear from our Article 162 that if you have a problem in that regard or to do with the environment, which is also a human rights matter, you go to the environment and lad court. So, my Lord, I'm here very humbly to tell you the mere fact that someone has run to you screaming Article 23, Article 165, does not without more mean that this court has jurisdiction to hear that matter. In other words, my Lord, for you to exercise jurisdiction over this matter, you've been told many matters, and as far as we are concerned, the matter before you, the substratum, is the impeachment. These things you're being told about Professor Kindiki are diversionaries or subsidiaries because without the impeachment, we will not be talking about Kindiki. So the substratum of the dispute before you is the impeachment. And our point, my lord, in the absence of an express grant of jurisdiction on this court, on the substratum of this dispute, on the subject of this dispute, which reminds me of Professor Gidu Muigei's issue about justiciability, then you have no jurisdiction. Luckily, my lord, I hope we all agree that there is no clause of our constitution that confers on this court jurisdiction to entertain the dispute before you. Which means, therefore, the question is whether nonetheless you have that jurisdiction given your broad powers under Article 23 and 165. Luckily, my Lord, our constitution was the product of a 20-year process that we call the constitutional process. And because it is in black and white, I invite you to go to page 5 of our battle, my Lord, the battle of authorities. We have produced you, or rather before you, extracts of the bombers constitutional the bombers draft constitution it confirms to us if you go to page six with me that during the constitutional process kenyans actually agonized over whether this matter should be handled in the court and which court and it's there in black and white article 187 on page six it says the Supreme Court shall have exclusive, that must mean to the exclusion of every other court, including this one, A Roman II disputes arising from the process of the impeachment of the president. So when we were having our debates through the bombers process, there was a decision, it's there in black and white, that there will be judicial review, not before this court, but in the Supreme Court. Of course we know, my lords, the bombers draft was one of many. The next draft that was generated in that process is at page seven of our battle, the harmonized draft constitution. At page eight, again, clause 201 of that draft constitution, it is clear there in Article 201, sub Article 4, that the Supreme Court has, paragraph A, exclusive, at the line exclusive. We move from that document, and luckily, my lords, the bench, to me, should be familiar with this process, to a document that went to the 2005 referendum, which was the worker draft. We have produced it at page 10 of our battle. This document is special, my lord, in the sense that it was subjected to a referendum before the people of Kenya. And again, you find there, Article 184, Kenyans were still toying with the idea that the courts can interfere with this process. But what I want you to mark again on page 11 
is that the court that had been envisioned is the Supreme Court, not the High Court. We all, of course, know that draft was rejected by the people of Kenya, and that must mean, because this is the draft that reached the referendum, that the people of Kenya also rejected this rule of judicial intervention in this problem before you. Why do I say so? The next document is now the official constitution we have today, which is the Constitution of Kenya 2010. And it has no clause conferring jurisdiction on this court or even the Supreme Court. And since that rule was always on the table, my lord, but was dropped from the final draft, we must take it that the final decision the people of Kenya made at the referendum of 2010 was that there would be no judicial intervention in the dispute of the nature before you. You are told that we have cited Article 144, yet it is irrelevant. Let's see shortly whether it's irrelevant. We have produced Article 144 on page 13 of our battle. My lords and my lady, you can only remove the president and the deputy president through two routes. Either the route of Article 144 or Article 145. We are only mentioning 144 to help us answer in the absence of express jurisdiction whether there is inferred jurisdiction. And when you check 144, one of the curious rules it, it tells you, 144, Article 144, 8 of our Constitution, is that the report of the tribunal shall be final and not subject to appeal. And if the tribunal reports that the president is capable of performing the functions uh, of the office, the speaker shall also communicate. And of course, it goes on to hold that if he finds the president is either insane or suffers an infirmity of body, then the Senate shall vote. Something curious here, my lord, that our Senate can vote to retain a president found by a medical tribunal to be insane, and our constitution says that decision cannot be challenged in any court or tribunal. Those are not my words. But more curiously, this rule is also repeated, my lord, in Article 165, and for me, what is notable, my lord, is, uh, you know, the Constitution speaks to an issue once. It has spoken about this issue of 144 in 144.9. And when you go to 165 again, it says this court has jurisdiction to hear an appeal from a tribunal on removal from office, except the tribunal under 144. I don't know, but it must count for something that those who drafted our constitution decided to deny jurisdiction not just once, but twice. So the million dollar question, my lord, if this court has been denied jurisdiction twice for the process under Article 144, on what basis can it assume jurisdiction for a process under Article 145, in the absence of express confirmment of that jurisdiction, and in the face of the multiple ousters I took you through, where the constitution says in black and white, this matter may be about the constitution, this matter may be about the Bill of Rights, but the High Court has no jurisdiction. That's what we mean when we say in our PO, my Lord, that there is Supreme Court jurisprudence in this country, I'm addressing you now, on the authority in advisory opinion number two, I believe of 2011. I don't know whether Professor Tom Ojeda was involved. <laughs> <laughs> but my Lord, we are told in that decision that jurisdiction cannot be arrogated through the craft of interpretation. 
what the petitioner and those in support of his cause are inviting the High Court to do is to arrogate to itself jurisdiction of a dispute or by the impeachment of the president through the craft of interpretation, through the craft of steel, through the craft of sophistry. Jurisdiction is something the court either has or does not have. It cannot be inferred. Professor Jende is telling me other things one must, must either have or not have. There is no middle ground. But I suppose he wants me to fall into trouble with the court, so I won't mention them. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's go to the decision in Nixon versus United States, which is at page 20. Again, you are told to laugh at me because this decision is from the 19th century, I will invite you to note it's a decision issued in the year 1993. I was in upper primary school in 1993, and my students say I'm still fairly young. So this is not a decision from the 19th century, my lord. But I also want to point to you, 1993 is so recent coming from the United States, a country that has had a constitution running for close to 300 years, now and counting. Why this decision is important, my lord, is several reasons. One, it is a decision from the United States Supreme Court. Two, our law on impeachment, and I hope again we have to quote my good friend Ongoya, the decency to agree that it is from the United States Constitution we borrowed Article 144 and 145. Even if you check the rule now in issue, Rule 11 here, Rule 11 in this decision of the Senate. So, this decision to the extent that it comes from the highest court of the country from which we got this idea now before you of impeachment, must surely be persuasive even if not binding on you. But more important, it is also about impeachment. What happened in this decision, my lord, is quite interesting. The person who had been impeached was a judge of a federal court in the U.S. He was sent to prison, but refused to resign from his judicial office. And because in the U.S., judges hold office for life to the extent that he refused to resign, it meant the U.S. Treasury was bound to continue paying his salary and a monument while he was in jail. And of course, that absurdity was not going to be let go. The United States Parliament called Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, took up impeachment and impeached this judge. But when you follow the holdings in this case, my lord, they say at page 20 of Wabadu that a controversy is non-justiciable where there is a textually demonstrable constitutional commitment of the issue to a coordinate political department of government. Or when you lack judicially discoverable or manageable standards or remedies for resolving it. I don't need to belabor the point when you read the case, the Sonko case and the Wabora case, that is exactly what our Supreme Court has said following this decision that impeachment is textually committed. Those are not my words. They are the words of the Supreme Court of the U.S., the Supreme Court of the Republic of Kenya. And, my Lord, we submit under Article 144, rather 145, impeachment is textually committed to the Senate. But they also say the language and structure of the Constitution confirm that textual commitment of this dispute. <coughs> More importantly, which is what the Attorney General, Emeritus Professor Mwege, if you go to page 21, my lord, you are told justiciability is also refuted by the lack of finality inherent in exposing the country's political life 
particularly if the president were impeached to months or perhaps years of chaos during judicial review of Senate. We already know, I've been telling you how the other side wants to grind the wheels. We are told by the Supreme Court, my Lord, this specter of the country being held on tenterhooks as this matter is fought here, is fought in the Court of Appeal. The average lifespan of a case in our Court of Appeal is three to five years, the last time I checked. Then going to the Supreme Court, we are being told the political life of a country cannot be held at ransom awaiting judicial determination. And more importantly, lastly, because my seniors are telling me I've been talking too much uh, so that I take my seat before they reprimand me, I want to refer you to page 32 of our battle. And the reason I'm referring it to you, my Lord, is many people will genuinely be shocked by this idea that a dispute like this is not justiciable. But there are good policy reasons for it. And if you read our page 32, which is that decision in Nixon versus United States, it tells you in black and white, there are sufficient safeguards embedded in the Constitution, including majorities, minimum voting thresholds required at every stage of that process, including the holding of a trial, including calling and cross-examination of witnesses. And because those safeguards, especially at the Senate, are in the nature of a trial, that's why Chief Justice Rankin tells us here that nobody should have to make every weather of the idea that this type of dispute is not justiciable. Lastly, you were told about political question doctrine and many things. I will invite you to note the courts of Kenya endorsed this doctrine as early as 205. Uh, again, the authority is on page 51 of our battle. I don't have time to take you through it. We have produced the song court decisions. We have the citations, the quotes we've lifted in our written submissions. And all we are telling you, my Lord, when all is said and done, is to do either of two things. Old, you have no jurisdiction. The consequence would be that these petitions must be struck out. The conservatory order must fall by the wayside, having been issued by a court lacking jurisdiction. But if my Lord find that too heavy and too radical, and therefore unacceptable to this court, I am giving you the alternative. If we must infer jurisdiction, because that's what you're being asked, let's infer it at the Supreme Court, which is the global practice, so that the matter is held uh, of this nature is added once and for all, without subjecting the country's political life. That is the public interest we have just been told from the Supreme Court of, of the United States. That's all, unless there is a question for me. Thank you. My Lord, uh, <clears throat> my lady, if it may please you. My name is Milimo. My Lord, I'm here to address you on three grounds. Specifically, my Lord, one on public participation. The second issue, my Lord, I'll be addressing you on is fair hearing with reference, my Lord, to the National Assembly. And lastly, on the nominee, my Lord, the deputy presidential nominee. My Lord, on the first point of public participation, you shall note first, my Lord, that there is no one in the petition before you who has alleged that they were denied an opportunity to participate in the public participation exercise. The second point, my Lord, is that it's common ground to all the parties that public participation 
was an essential ingredient in the impeachment proceedings. And that is, my lord, dictated by Article 118B of the Constitution. And my lord, on the boxes to be ticked in reference to the public participation exercise, I invite you, my lord, to refer to the Supreme Court BAT decision. And specifically, my lord, at page 45 of that decision, which we have attached, my lord, to the first respondent's supplementary list and bundle of authorities dated 28th of this month. My Lord, the second authority that I will refer you to on matters public participation is the recent authority, my Lord, that was rendered last week by the High Court in the affordable housing decision, my Lord, that is petition number A. 154 of 2024 and specifically my lord at pages 178 to 179 rather to 184 of that decision my lord if you are to refer to the replying affidavit of the national assembly you will note that the national assembly my lord undertook an unprecedented public participation exercise. None of that nature and magnitude, my lord, has been undertaken in the history of this country. And my lord, I will refer you to the annexed public participation report and specifically, my lord, at pages 427 to 555 of the replying affidavit of the National Assembly. And my Lord, very quickly, you note that over 224,000 people my Lord, over 224,000 people were involved in the exercise where they volunteered to give their views. And after of course, my Lord, you shall note that 65% of the people who rendered their views were in support of the motion. Is this submission for the uh, lifting of orders or for or for a uh, petition? My, my, my Lord, I'm, I'm trying to establish the fact that heavy weather was made, my Lord, on the fact that there was no public We have noted those heavy weathers, but you know, we need to be, because we are all lawyers and judges, we need to be specific to the issue before the court. Some of the things which you say here are actually not meant for this forum. We've been trying not to intervene, but you know very well that a lot of submissions which have been made here are not for the proceedings today. They are meant for another proceeding altogether. So if you can just avoid them, the better for us. Yes, my lord, I, I stand guided, and then that... In, a, in other words, <coughs> Mr. Milimo, you may spare us a submission on the sufficiency of the public participation. Correct, my lord. Yes, my, my, my lord, I, I stand guided, and, and I was just going, my lord, to refer you to one authority that we had, uh, my lord, attached uh, as authority number one in the supplementary list of authorities. If you are to look at page four of that authority, my lord, the sufficiency or otherwise of public participation exercise, my lord, is to be determined at the main trial. And my lord, therefore, I would agree with you that all I need to do, my lord, is to refer you to the report that I've indicated, my lord, that it appears at page 427, specifically the findings, my lord, to 455 of the replying affidavit. But my lord, allow me just to pick one thing out of that report. You are particularly, my lord, referred to one of the constituencies, specifically, my lord, Keio South constituency. Why are my learned colleagues, my lord, raised issues that indeed the figures did not tally? My lord, first, you shall note that the figures that were quoted by the petition, my lord, are contained nowhere in the public participation report 
that have been submitted before you. My Lord, I want to believe that my line colleagues got that information from sources other than the report that was submitted at the National Assembly. My Lord, KU South uh, views, my Lord, as submitted are uh, to be found firstly at page 289 of the report, my Lord, and it appears at as item number 95. And this goes specifically, my Lord, to the hand-delivered and email views where it was indicated that, my Lord, there was a total of 465 responses and out of, out of those, my Lord, 455 were in support. That is what, my Lord, is contained in the report as the first limb. The second limb, my Lord, is for those who participated in the public hearings of the fourth, my Lord, of October and is found at page 331. Same KO South constituency. And my Lord, it's indicated that a total of 355 people did, my Lord, attend that public hearing. And out of those, 352 persons, my Lord, supported the motion. Lastly, on that point, my Lord, is to refer you to page 440 of the replying affidavit. My Lord, where you shall not, not 440, my Lord, I'm sorry, page 439, where, my Lord, you shall note that the total responses in respect of KO South constituency were 820. And that out of those, my Lord, in support were 8 or 7. So, my Lord, the views are submitted, or the submissions are submitted by my Lord and colleagues, my Lord, do not find any favor in the report. And therefore, my Lord, I'll urge you that you do ignore them. My Lord, I also need to point out that public participation, my Lord, is not a referendum. As well understood, my Lord. And that in the words, my Lord, of your learned brother, justices and sisters, my Lord, in the affordable housing decision, public participation does not, my Lord, necessarily mean that everyone in the country must give their opinions. My Lord, that is paragraph 175 of the affordable housing decision. And that, my Lord, all that the National Assembly was required to do at paragraph 176 is to give the public an opportunity, my Lord, to submit their views. And my Lord, you shall note that in the report, all that was done by the National Assembly. And therefore, in the fullness of time, my Lord, we shall demonstrate before you that there's absolutely no arguable point and the public participation exercise that was conducted, my Lord, by the National Assembly was not only meaningful, but was sufficient both qualitatively and quantitatively. My Lord, the other issue that was raised was by my learning colleague, Mr. Omari, on public participation, where he indicated, my Lord, that elections are conducted at the polling stations. My Lord, that submission is not true. The presidential, my Lord, elections are provided for in terms of being conducted, my Lord, at Article 138.2, where it states, my Lord, that the elections are at the constituency level and not at the polling station. My Lord, the other issue that arose from the submissions from my Rani colleagues is whether, my Lord, the first petitioner was given an opportunity to present his reply to the public prior to the public participation. My Lord, my answer to that is simple. That first, my Lord, the public participation exercise commenced on 2nd of October all the way to 5th. And my Lord, by the time the public participation commenced, the first petitioner had not submitted his response or lodged his response to the National Assembly. And therefore, there's no way, my Lord, that that response could have been availed to the public. Secondly, that, my Lord, the National Assembly only avails what is in its possession. And therefore, at that point, my Lord, the National Assembly could not have been accused of not, my Lord, presenting to the public what had not presented to it. But more important, my Lord, there is no legal requirement. And none was cited by a land colleague that dictates that the National Assembly had a duty 
to present my lord that response to the public during public participation and last my lord nothing stopped the first petition of my lord from himself presenting that response to the public as he did my lord on the eve of the hearing or proceedings at the national assembly the last point my lord on public participation was whether my lord the senate ought to have conducted the public participation exercise and my lord my answer to that is this that under article 118b my lord of the constitution parliament is yes required to conduct public participation but my lord parliament under article 93.1 refers to both the senate and the national assembly and my lord you shall note that the impeachment proceedings are too tired that the first stage my lord is conducted by the national assembly and the second one the trial chamber is the senate the senate sits as a quasi judicial organ my lord in respect of the impeachment proceedings and that it's not required to repeat the public participation exercise because if that were to be so my lord then it means that even this court city in exercise of a judicial function it could be required my lord to end undertake the public participation Mr. exercise Mr. Melimba, we only entertain you on these submissions because we had entertained other people earlier that is the only reason we are listening to you i, I thank you my lord but, but I'm, I'm winding up on that my lord <laughs> yes <laughs> my lord the second issue that my lord i will bring i'll invite your attention to is on the subject my lord of fair hearing my lord and on that limb there was a challenge my lord to the standing orders of the national assembly my lord my answer to that is simple that there is a presumption of constitutionality of those standing orders my lord and that at this stage being an intellectual stage this court my lord has no power to invalidate those standing orders my lord in the fullness of time during my lord the main hearing we shall demonstrate to you that those standing orders my lord reflect article 145 and 150 of the constitution and that their simple duty my lord is to implement those articles of the constitution the other issue my lord that was raised was about impartiality of the speaker the national assembly my lord yes um, and my lord you shall note that the speaker of the national assembly my lord has no vote in the proceedings and that is my lord under article 122 to a of the constitution and that submission therefore my lord is not a valid submission and my lord more importantly my lord you shall note also that at the national assembly the first petitioner was given an opportunity to both appear and be heard and my lord he did file a substantive response to the notice of motion and more importantly my lord he was given two hours to present oral present representations that opportunity he took my lord and therefore the question of their having my lord been a breach on the elements of fair hearing does not arise whatsoever or at all my lord my last point is on the nomination my lord of my good teacher professor kindiki and my lord the issue was whether there ought to have been my lord an approval process at the national assembly and whether my lord there ought to have been public participation as well as my lord the timelines that were invoked my lord to process the good professor yes my lord all i need my lord to bring to your attention is there was a ruling my lord by the speaker of the national assembly that we attached to the first respondent supplemental list and band of authorities 
dated Malod the 28th of October this year. And Malod, you shall note that in that communication, the speaker did address all those issues, Malod. The communication, Malod, is communication number is communication number 54 of 2024 and it's dated the 18th October 2024 <coughs> where my lord the speaker did address in giving guidance to the house all those issues and I'll invite you my lord to refer to it when you retire my colleague Mr. Machari my lord on a light note told the court that my lord I would have said Weta Tosha my lord, I'll say that in 2032 when the right comes. <laughs> I thank you, my lord. Unless uh, your leadership have any questions. My lords and my lady, I'll proceed from where my learned friend Mr. Milima stopped. Permit me, for completeness of record, to say that uh, the second respondent has filed an application dated the 18th of October 2022. We have filed submissions in support of that application, again dated the 18th of October 2022. And we have a replying affidavit sworn by one Samuel Jeroge on the 21st of October 2024. I'm reminded by my colleagues that I forgot to mention my name for completeness of record. My name is Eric Gumboff. In understanding the application and the prayers that are currently live before the court, permit me to draw your attention to the application filed by our learned colleagues in uh, the matter 565 for 2024 for just one purpose only. The application has a total of about 13 prayers. The prayer number one, all the way to prayer number uh, 10 have been spent. In other words, they've been overtaken by events. The last prayer, which perhaps would have been relevant for purposes of understanding what uh, uh, I'm trying to get to, is prayer number nine, which talks about that pending the hearing and determination of a petition, a conservatory order restraining the National Assembly of Kenya from discussing, vetting, voting, and or approving the nomination of a person submitted to the National Assembly made on the 18th of October 2024 by the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency uh, William Samoy Ruto, to, full, to fill the vacancy of the office of the Deputy, Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. That prayer is equally overtaken by events. The last prayer is for deletion of what they call falsehoods to various persons and institutions. It then follows, my lords and my lady, that uh, the petitioner, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, has no prayer that is live before you in relation to the question of conservatory order. <coughs> Looking at the application number E015, the only prayer that is live before you is prayer number C and prayer number E, both of which deal with the question of swearing in of the second interested party appointed by the president and approved by the National Assembly, they say, from assuming the office of the deputy president. It then is our submission that the threshold question, the arguability question, the negatory question needs to then address the issue of swearing in. I will then straight go to the issue of swearing in. My lords and my lady, 
we have spoken to the provisions of Article 147, 1457. 1457, very clearly, indicates that if at least two thirds of the members of the Senate vote to uphold any impeachment charge, the president shall <coughs> cease to hold office. May I add to the submissions that have been made previously that that provision is a self-executing provision. You do not need more. It is not an action of the Senate. It is an action of the Constitution itself. The first question that then we would want to ask ourselves this afternoon is in light of view of such an express provision of the Constitution, is it tenable that an order of this court would issue to stop it. Let me take as one step further to remind us that at the point at which the deputy president was impeached, he then acquired a constitutional blemish. And we say a constitutional blemish because under the provisions of Article 150, All the charges that were substantiated as against him, including the question of gross violation of the provisions of this constitution, re serious reasons to believe that the deputy president committed a crime under the national or international law, and gross misconduct, then were issues that would be said to have informed his constitutional standing. Now, where am I going with that? I'm going, I'm trying to make the point that when the Constitution, therefore, has put a dot or a blemish on you, then certainly you become unsuitable to hold office by dint of Chapter 6 of our Constitution. That is, specifically, I would draw your attentions to the provisions of Article 73, Sabbatical 1, which says, uh, talks about leadership and integrity, responsibility of leadership. It says, authority assigned to a state officer is a public trust to be exercised in a manner that, three, brings honor to the nation and dignity of the office. To the extent that those uh, grounds were established under Article 150, it simply means that the person uh, of uh, His Excellency the Deputy President therefore lost the capacity. And why that is important is then as you consider this question as to whether to grant uh, the conservatory orders or not, would he be one person who would possibly be considered for that situation? And our answer is a simple <coughs> no. Permit me to speak to the issue of now Article 149. Article 149 reads, within 14 days after vacancy of, uh, in the office of a deputy president arises, the president shall nominate a person to fill the vacancy and the National Assembly shall vote on the nomination within 60 days after receiving it. First point I would want to make, just to complement what my learned friend Mr. Mudomi has spoken to, as to the justiciability. If the Constitution says that within 14 days of coming into play of Article 145.7, is it practical, is it tenable, that within those 14 days, if a party were to have come to court, then going through the hierarchy of the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court, any dispute touching on that question of nomination would have been resolved. That then speaks to the architecture of our Constitution, to the extent that it is not contemplated that the person who has been impeached would therefore be able to run or even express interest for nomination for purposes of uh, uh, Article 149. Let me then uh, take it one step further to relate uh, Article 149 and 148. In particular, Once, let me start this conversation from one step behind. 
our constitution at Article 1, Sabbatical 2 speaks to how our sovereign power is to be exercised. In particular, it says the people may exercise their sovereign power either directly or through their democratically elected representatives. Now, we then relate this to the events of uh, first Article 94, uh, Sabbatical 2, which says the role of parliament shall be parliament manifests the diversity of the nation, represents the will of the people, and exercises their sovereignty. What point am I trying to make? A lot of heavy weather has been made about the candidate who has been presented for purposes of approval under this constitution. Now, one of the issues that has been raised is that there was no public participation in relation to the candidature of Professor Kidure Kindiki. My lord and my lady, allow me to just take us very quickly to the provisions of Article 149 to provide some bit of context. That within 14 days, allow me to just read it again, within 14 days after a vacancy in the office of a deputy president arises, the president shall nominate a person to fill the vacancy and the National Assembly shall vote on the nomination within 60 days. Vote is the word used. I want to persuade you, my lords and my lady, that the action that the members of the National Assembly would be taking, pursuant to this 149.9, flows from the delegated authority under Article 1, Sabbatical 2. It also flows to the role of parliamentarians under Article 94, Sabbatical 2, to exercise the will of the people of Kenya, to exercise their sovereignty. In other words, that is a choice that the National Assembly is making as the representatives of their people. And why that is important is the very question that follows, is when making that decision, is public participation an imperative? Our answer, my lords and my lady, is a straight no. And so that then I give you context. Let me give us what happens in the ordinary elections and which will be at uh, Article 148. Article 148, Sabbatical 1, reads, each candidate in a presidential election shall nominate a person who is qualified for nomination for election as president as a candidate for deputy president. <coughs> then it adds at Sabbatical 2 that for purposes of Clause 1, there shall be no separate nomination process for the deputy president and uh, Article 137, 1D shall not apply to the candidate of the deputy president. What then do we read from that? It means that a simple reading of Article 148, which is what happens in our ordinary elections, does not call for public participation for the position of the nominated person to occupy uh, uh, the office of the deputy president. Now, if we are to agree, and we have seen it in real life, that that is what happens. We don't then subject them as to we don't subject them to uh, you know public views around what people think about them, sending a memorandum. Once that nomination is done, there is no more that follows other than the declaration after the election itself. Now, why is this important? It is important because of a submission that was made earlier in relation to other provisions of the constitution which call for public participation. Examples would be in Article 132, for instance, under the functions of a president, sub, uh, Article 132, Sabbatical 2, under the functions of a president, the constitution says the president shall nominate and with approval of a national assembly appoint or may dismiss A, cabinet secretaries, B, attorney general, C, the secretary uh, to the cabinet in accordance with Article 154, uh, and the principal secretaries in accordance with Article 155. It is in that instant that then public participation is called for. So that then when the uh, constitution talks of approve, it means give an opportunity to the parliamentarians to also interrogate the person that is to be uh, uh, approved for whatever position we have. 
In this case, it is the and it is our submission that the constitution says vote, meaning elect this person. And the test to be derived from that is first past the poll. In other words, at the point of voting, do the parliamentarians vote to support or uh, 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 a majority of them support the nomination. That is the uh, simple question that would be presented before you this, uh, I mean for determination. Permit me then to move on to speak to the place of public interest in relation to this process. Now, it would be expected that pursuant to the provisions of Article 146.2, that when a vacancy occurs in the office of the president, the, pre the, the deputy president shall assume office as president for the remainder of the term of the president. Number two. Uh, that is sub article 2b that if the office of deputy president is vacant or the deputy president is unable to assume the office of a president the speaker of the national assembly shall act as a president and an election to the office of, pre of the president shall be held within 60 days after the vacancy arose in the office of the president what is the public interest question the public interest question is it is expected it is a legitimate expectation by the people of kenya that they'll have a president in the absence of a president they will have a deputy president in the absence of a deputy president that will have a situation where the speaker would be able to steer the country into an election the public interest question that we want to ask or present to the court would it be in the interest of uh, now that it is clear that there is no occupant of the office of a deputy president would it be in the interest of the public to expect or to push the country to a potential uh, uh, election under this article because we want to issue orders that would stay the filling of that office in our uh, understanding my lord Semeleri, that would be pushing the constitution a little too far it should not be lost on us that this same petitioner i mean this the move of this very petition during uh, the discussions around the motion itself we had terms like kufa dereva kufa makanga what stops him from <coughs> filing yet another impeachment motion against his excellency the president tomorrow it shall be processed if it is processed we'll have walked straight into a constitutional crisis now that militates against public interest and we're saying crisis because we live in this country and we know that as a matter of fact we do not have a duly constituted electoral commission even if it was the case that we have a deputy president as of today then pursuant to the provisions of again article 134 which speaks to temporary incumbency such person would not be able to appoint the electoral commission mm -hmm. what then does that mean it means potentially that the first person to get to uhuru park and get sworn will be the president my lords and my lady is that a position we would want to allow the country to get into permit me to add by saying this that these constitutional principles are exercised within a particular context it is a political context political context by its own nature and i had my learned friends speak to the fact that we live in a constitutional democracy is a competition in that competition there will be those who will be for one party and those who will be for the other party naturally it follows that when one party loses office there will be some measure of discomfort what then does the court do it is in those occasions that the court rises to steer the country through that process so that then the competing interests are balanced in a way that ensures the stability of the country and because they're deep uh, it's, it's it's very interesting and very uh, i mean uh, something to be very proud about to be kenyans today that we are talking about such, such sensitive issues in this sort of a civil environment my lord and my lady 
in other places, when we talk about this sort of transitions, these are constitutional transitions, they end up subjecting the populace to more difficult positions. Now, because we have this opportunity, what then would the court be considering in whether to grant the orders that have been sought or not? Malan Semeledi, the constitution, constitutionalism, speaks to something we call utilitarianism. Utilitarianism dictates that the country, the court, helps maintain what I would call constitutional homeostasis. That means that we then ensure that whatever decision we take is such as to ensure that there is stability within the country and that the country is given an opportunity to move on. Malawas and Malady, this are jurisprudential discussions that have found favor with those who have, there, who have been there before us. We've been told in our learning of jurisprudence about Jeremy Bentham, about Arthur Stewart Mill, they were great proponents of utilitarianism as a concept of constitutionalism. May I also invite you to the works and findings of Roscoe Pound, who postulates that the law is supposed to be a tool of social engineering and that then in its implementation that social engineering is supposed to help to bring stability within the nation. My lord, my lady, it only follows that for us to achieve that stability then the orders that were issued and that they are ex parte are orders that are supposed to be set aside, the country allowed to move aside. I am most obliged. Thank you. My Lord, the presiding judge, as I sit down and begin to make my submissions in opposition to the notice of the motion before you, may I kindly request the court to ask that that light, which is a bit blinding, be either angled further up or turned off completely. The light has had. <laughs> I guess that makes it a smart light. It can understand and react. My Lord, the applications before you for conservatory orders this evening are opposed. Um, for the record, I am Paul Nyamodi. I am on record with, together with my learned friend, Mr. Gumbo for the second respondent. And my Lord, I wish to commence my submission by saying that the task before you this evening is a rather simple task. Uh, listening to my colleagues making their submissions, um, one would be uh, forgiven if they formed the impression that what was for hearing before you was the petition proper. It is not. What is before you for hearing are two applications for conservatory orders and my lord it is my submission that the criteria which you will no doubt consider when you retire to consider your decision in this matter is straightforward is there do the petitions before you disclose inherent merit would those petitions be rendered nugatory if the conservatory orders that are sought are not granted and lastly and most importantly, is it in the public interest to grant the conservatory orders that are sought? I wish to state that the purpose of a conservatory order or the ultimate beneficiary of a conservatory order is the court. And not the party that seeks the conservatory order. I say so because the purpose of a conservatory order, my lords, is to preserve a situation so that the orders of the court upon conclusion of the hearing of the petition are efficacious. <coughs> that is not achieved by returning anybody to office. That is merely achieved by maintaining a certain status quo for the benefit of the court. 
So anybody who seeks to persuade you that they, are, they can be returned to office by a conservatory order, then perhaps has misunderstood what indeed a conservatory order is. My lords, just to pull the strands together from the submissions that have been made by my learned colleagues for the respondent, and the context in which I urge my lords, my lady, to view those submissions, is that they have spoken to the first ground. They have spoken to the first ground in Peter Munya. They have spoken, or they are responding to the question, is there inherent merit in the petitions that are before you? All the submissions about public participation, all the submissions about the uh, Article 50 rights are all in an attempt to persuade you that there is no inherent merit in those petitions. And I don't wish to go back on those, but I wish to just put two issues before you in respect of the question of inherent merit. My lord, my lady, when you retire to consider your decision in this matter, I'm sure you will need no reminding that the issue of or a merit review of the impeachment process is beyond the ability of this court. So reject any requests from the petitioners to conduct a merit review of the impeachment. What this court is able to do, and I believe that is uh, the, the, the decision of the Supreme Court in Sonko, is to carry out a process review. And so that you are, so I, I then submit that in determining whether there is inherent merit, this court must then constrain itself to carrying out a process review. My lords, my lady, the second point I wish to make in respect of inherent merit is this. This is, or these petitions arise from a concluded <coughs> impeachment process. In that impeachment process, as you have heard, there were 11 grounds for impeachment. From those 11 grounds, the Senate rejected six and confirmed five. Out of those five, three grounds, and those are grounds one, ground five, and ground six, turned on the conversation or the issue that has come to be known as the shareholder narrative. <coughs> now, the first petitioner does not deny that he said those things that he is alleged to have said. It is my submission that there being no denial as to those utterances from the first petitioner, he acknowledges that he said them. There is an admission from the petitioner that he said those things that he said. Now, those three grounds of impeachment flowing from facts that the petitioner has admitted, can there be any inherent merit in a petition that seeks to challenge grounds that he has admitted? Ground one, ground five, and ground six all flow from the shareholder narrative. It is my submission that there can be no inherent merit in those petitions. The finding by the Senate flows from an admission, and that then takes away the ability of the first petitioner to challenge the Senate's finding. My lords, my lady, I wish to move on to the second ground or the second issue that you are you you would need to consider when you retire to consider your decision on this matter, and that is the issue of whether the petitions would be rendered nugatory if the conservatory orders that are sought are not granted. And I wish to submit on it with the conjoined issue of what is the appropriate remedy in the circumstances of these petitions. My lords, my ladies, in my preparation for my submissions before you this evening, I came across uh, a pitch of a decision. And I wish to persuade you 
that the applications before you are for dismissal. And I wish to persuade you by reference to the notices of motion that are before you and to decisions of this court that have been rendered in respect of similar <coughs> matters. But look, there is a decision that is in pari material with this one completely, and I say so for these reasons. The decision, and we have filed it as our, in a supplementary list of authority, is the decision of the High Court of Kenya in Constitutional Petition Number 4 of 2024, Purity Mora Kerira versus the Senate and eight others. It is a decision of the High Court of Kenya in Nyamira. And it is a decision of your sister, Justice Wilfrida Okoin. We have filed it I, as, as a supplementary uh, authority, but I have taken the liberty, because it is important to our submission, to make copies available to the bench, which I wish to uh, just walk you through quickly uh, during my submission. My Lord, I submit that that decision is in pari materia with this one for the following reasons. It arises from a impeachment process of the Deputy Governor of TC County. As I will demonstrate in a moment, the impeachment was preceded by litigation. The impeachment of the first petitioner in this matter was preceded by no less than 29 petitions. My lords, in that matter, a conservatory order was issued in a petition brought by a surrogate litigant. And perhaps I might want to explain what I mean by a surrogate litigant. Our constitution enables constitutional litigation by a person other than the direct beneficiary of the order sought. And for the purposes of my submission, I seek your Lordship's permission to refer to that sort of litigation as surrogate litigation. In this matter, a conservatory order is issued in a petition filed by a surrogate litigant. Subsequent to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the impeachment of the Deputy Governor of Kisi by the County Assembly of Kisi, the matters are then, or the various matters are then directed through the office of the Principal Judge to Lady Justice Wilfrida Okwain sitting in Nyamira. And Lady Justice Okwain is then faced with an application such as the one before this court this evening, where a party who has obtained ex parte conservatory orders wishes to persuade the court to confirm those orders. My Lord, I wish to start my reference to this decision in paragraph 63 of that decision. <coughs> paragraph 63 is to be found on page 17. And in her usual succinct style, Lady Justice Okoin holds as follows. My attention is drawn to the use of the term and in the above cited decision, which connotes that the parameters set for the granting of conservatory orders are to be, are to be considered conjunctively and not disjunctively. The decision she's referring to is the decision of Wilson Kibera versus the Judges and Magistrates Vetting Board. It is in paragraph 62 and it sets out the criteria for the grant of a conservatory order. She goes on to conclude in paragraph 63. This means that the failure to satisfy one parameter leads to the collapse of the entire application for the failure to meet the threshold set for granting of conservatory orders. And is used between the threshold issue, between the issue of inherent merit and nugatory. We have submitted sufficiently on the issue of inherent merit. I will not add to it. I will leave it to your lordships and your ladyship to decide. But I wish to state that in the petition before you, the petition would not be rendered nugatory if the conservatory orders sought were not granted. And I wish to commence that submission by reference to the notices of motion themselves. The first notice of motion I wish to refer the members of the court to is the notice of motion in petition 655 of 2024, where the first petitioner, the uh, deputy or the former deputy president of the Republic of Kenya, is the petitioner. My line colleague, Mr. Gumbo, has gone through the 
the, the, the prayers that are spent and those that are live. But I want to focus on prayer 6 and prayer 7. <coughs> prayer 6 and prayer 7 of the Notice of Motion. Prayer 6 reads, pending the hearing and determination of the petition, a, consul a conservatory order be issued staying the effect implementation in any way including by gazettement and by any person of the vote resolution made in any way including by way of transmission to the national assembly or the president of the Re uh, sorry or to the president of the republic of kenya the vote slash resolution passed by the senate of kenya on the 17th of october 2024 upholding the impeachment charges against deputy president of the republic of kenya his excellency Rigabe Igeshago. My lords, my ladies, I wish to refer you now to the other notice of motion before you. That is the notice of motion in petition number 15 from Kerugoya. And I wish to refer you to prayer D in that notice of motion. Prayer D in that notice of motion reads as follows. Pending the hearing and determination of this petition, this honorable court be pleased to issue a conservatory order staying the implementation of the resolution passed by the Senate and published by the Gazette Notice number 13,400 on the 17th of October 2024, removing the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, from office by way of impeachment. Those three prayers seek to stay the impeachment. Mr. Gumbo has submitted about the effect of the impeachment. I wish to refer you now to the finding of your sister, Lady Justice Wilfrida Okwan, in respect to those sort of prayers. My Lord, paragraph 71 of Justice Okwan's decision reads as follows. In the instant case, I note that the impugned impeachment process has, has already gone full circle, uh, has been concluded, and a final resolution made by the Senate to impeach the ninth respondent. And again, here the deputy governor was the ninth respondent, uh, and the petitioner was the surrogate respondent. Uh, respondent. Uh, uh, ninth respondent as at the time the instant petition was filed. It is instructive to note that the impeachment proceeded despite spirited attempts by the ninth respondent to stop the process through applications made in, uh, in, uh, in, in similar petitions that are still pending before various courts. That is not too dissimilar to this and those are the petitions that are before you under the first cohort, petition 522. Paragraph 72, the question which arises uh, is if this court can issue orders whose effect will be to stay the decision by the Senate to impeach the ninth respondent pending the hearing and determination of the petition. My finding is that since the Senate has already made a resolution, the court must exercise restraint and limit its, 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 its intervention in the impeachment to hearing the merits of the petition. I further find that issuing conservatory orders to stay the Senate's decision will be akin to directing or interfering with other organs slash arm of government in exercise of its mandate. My lords, my ladies, in respect of the two prayers or the three prayers that I have highlighted, I urge you strongly to adopt the same finding as Lady Justice Okwan in paragraphs 71 and 72. My lords, my ladies, Lady Justice Okwan then goes on substantively to deal with the consideration on the second ground of Nubeto. In paragraph 73, she, she states, the other pertinent question is whether the instant petition will be rendered nugatory or worthless if the orders sought in the first application are not granted. Now, she then begins to reflect on the nugatory consideration. My lord, in paragraph 74, she states, the answer to the above question is to the negative. And she starts straight from the beginning by saying no. <coughs> I find that the applicants claim that the petition will be rendered nugatory to be misconceived and unfounded. My finding is informed by three main issues. And she goes on. Firstly, the applicant's petition is still pending for hearing and is therefore possible, and, and, and is therefore possible that the court may, after hearing the petition, arrive at a finding that the impeachment process was flawed. Very much like in this matter. She goes on. In, 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 such, in, in such an eventuality, the court may grant the petitioner 
and indeed the ninth respondent, various remedies including, and this is important, compensation for wrongful removal or reinstatement. Compensation for wrongful removal. One of my learned colleagues suggested that compensation or one month salary is a remedy. That is a remedy as confirmed by your sister Lady Justice Kwan. And she also states that reinstatement is possible. She goes on. I find guidance in the decision in Muhammad and six others versus the County Assembly of Wajia. This is the decision called the Wajia decision where the court ordered for the reinstatement of the governor who had gone through the entire impeachment process up to the Senate. The court rendered itself thus, and this finding is important, and I submit that when you retire to consider your decision in this matter, go through the Wajia decision and see the entire raft of relief that that three judge bench sitting in Meru did. And the relief was as follows. Uh, as appropriate consequential relief, an order of mandatory injunction is granted against the eighth respondent, Ahmed Ali Mukhtar. This was the deputy governor who had been sworn in as governor after the impeachment of the governor, compelling him to hand over and restore the office of governor of the county of Wajia to the seventh petitioner, Ambassador Mohammed Abdi Mahmoud. That is the appropriate remedy. And I had stated at the beginning that a conservatory order is given for the benefit of the court, not for any party. And if the court then has that ability, then there is no need, I submit, to then issue a conservatory order. But to explain herself further, I refer you to paragraph 77 of that decision. Lady Justice O'Quinn states as follows. She states that this court takes the view that an impeachment process can be likened to an election process where, for example, a governor and his deputy are elected by majority votes. Following such an election, the will of the majority voters prevails and is acted upon within the timelines set under law. This is done through the gazettement and swearing in of the deputy governor, of the governor and his deputy, I'm sorry, within the set timelines, irrespective of the existence of a petition challenge. In other words, the outcome of an election cannot be stayed through a conservatory order. Suffice it to say, that if at the conclusion of the election, petition challenging such an election, the election court finds that the election process was marred with irregularities, then the election will be nullified and the aggrieved party granted suitable reliefs. Importantly, in paragraph 78, overly, in similar fashion, and as I have already stated in this ruling, if upon hearing the merits of the instant petition, this court finds in favor of the petitioner, then the ninth, ninth respondent will get appropriate remedies, which may include reinstatement to his position of deputy governor, as was held in the Wajia case. And I urge you to substitute deputy governor with deputy president. There is no difference in the position. He is a deputy to an executive office created under the Constitution. She concludes, I am therefore not persuaded that the instant petition will be rendered nugatory unless the conservatory orders granted, uh, sought are granted to the first applicant. My Lord, this is the same as in this matter. <coughs> there, there are effective remedies. There is reinstatement. There is damages. My Lord, reflecting further on the issue, in paragraph 79, the last sentence, or the second last sentence, beginning on the third line from the bottom, Lady Justice Okwan says the following. I find, I further find, that since the office of deputy governor is a public office, it does not belong to a specific individual. It follows that once the office holder is impeached, he has to give room to the next office holder, unless and until such impeachment is overturned or nullified by an order of the court. There is no difference in this matter. The office of deputy president is an office in the public service. It has been submitted that it is a trust. It does not belong to, there is no right post impeachment that the first petitioner can claim to that office. But profoundly, in paragraph 80, she concludes as follows. I find that in the circumstances of this case, the rights stroke interest of the people of Kisi. I urge the court to read the people of Kenya to be represented and served by a duly appointed deputy president. 
read deputy governor, read deputy president, following the ninth respondent's impeachment, far outweighs the prejudice, if any, that the applicant herein will suffer if the orders sought in her application are not granted.